Thank you, Your Honors, and may it please the court. I'd like to focus on two issues today in particular. The first is when a lower court judge issues a discretionary decision, whether that decision must be accompanied with stated rationales at the time it's issued. The second issue, if we have time, that I would like to focus on is what is the interaction between Rule 56E, which talks about whether the court may take facts as undisputed if it's not opposed at summary judgment, and how that interacts with Rule 56C's requirement that puts a burden on the movement <laughs> to demonstrate there's no issue, genuine issue of material fact. Starting with the discretionary decisions issue, there are a number of decisions from the lower court below where summary electronic orders were issued saying granted or not granted. And later on in the litigation, the judge in particular with regards to seeking scheduling extensions appears to have changed her rationales over time, causing both confusion for the parties as well as prejudicing Professor Butler's ability to adequately explain to the court why further extensions of time were needed. For instance, a second extension of time for summary judgment was granted, again with an electronic order that just said uh, motion granted, no explanation as to why it's granted. At the time I appeared in the case where, as you can see from the record, I discovered that there were no filings prepared to oppose summary judgment, I entered myself pro hoc vice and I immediately requested an extension of time because former counsel had not prepared any filings and it was less than 24 hours before those filings were due. Later on, after denying my third motion for extension with no explanation, I sought reconsideration to try to what I thought was correct the factual record as well as to remind the district court that even discretionary decisions under this court's precedence require stated rationales. The district court held against my client the fact that, purportedly, the second motion for extension was granted, but it was brought in bad faith. At which point, as motions for reconsideration uh, continued, as I again tried to correct factual findings that weren't supported by the record, as well as some legal points that were contrary to circuit precedent, the district court's rationales for why it did what it did in the past were ever evolving, making it impossible for my client to meaningfully respond to them proactively. And oh, but okay. I think part of the problem was that, I'm sorry. Well, no, it's funny. Well, that was, go ahead. What was, what was ever ever evolving was your client's version of events as to why they couldn't get the motion response on file. Well, I I mean, in other words, you can't come in and ask for an extension of time based on one set of facts and explanation and representations to the court and then come in later and ask for another extension based on contradictory uh, representations about why it's needed. And I would understand that, Your Honor, if my client had approved the previous motions for extension. We asked to supplement the... Isn't your client responsible for what her lawyer does in the case? Not if her lawyer files, makes paper filings with the court that are, she was not apprised of and that are supposedly premised on facts about her workload that were not true at the time. Uh, we filed to supplement the record because some documents that were sealed below didn't make it into the electronic record on appeal. And there are detailed declarations. There are ECF numbers 148 and 149. There are detailed records where we gave screenshots of cell phone texts, of emails between my client that are timestamped that say, I just discovered that you filed this saying that it's my fault I couldn't get my grades in on time and you asked for an extension, you didn't tell me you were asking for this extension. Also, where are the draft filings to review? This is due. Yeah, so what is our review standard, do you th would you say, for the argument you're making right now? Um, for I think your review standard, to the extent the district court relied upon the notion that no rationales need be provided for discretionary decisions, that's just a pure issue of law, Your Honor. That I well, Judge Brown ultimately know. does make uh, some explanations, uh, maybe after the fact. You say that, I forget your, your characterization, but they're a shifting uh, explanation. But it does seem to me uh, that what we're basically looking at is a fairly common issue of uh, whether the district judge abused her discretion in making decisions on keeping a case moving. You may not accept all that, but she does ultimately give answers. She does ultimately um, uh, 
make the decisions that she that she did what is your ultimate complaint about this is it how she handled some summary judgment or what ultimately does this go to the arguments that you're making now i think that this ultimately goes to issues that tilted unfairly in uh a pelley's favor my client's ability to docket summary judgment as well as to seek the withdrawal of her counsel whom she terminated over these very problems with the summary judgment opposition filings not being prepared at all. Okay, well, we, we have that part of your argument. Let me ask you about uh, the discovery issue and the tenure box. Yes. Tenure box. Uh, my understanding from what the record shows is that you did not ask, I didn't look at all the discovery requests, but looking at the responses to it, you did not specifically ask for the tenure box, tenure box, but uh, the uh, appellees responded with whatever it is, the big number, 17,000 pages of discovery, whatever, you can certainly correct me if that's wrong. Uh, and it seems to me the issue is, is there anything they, uh, that was not provided to you that would fit into the category of tenure box, tenure box, when you did not specifically ever ask for that but you did ask for things that, at least my understanding of discovery, in this case, would have covered what was in the tenure box. So correct me where I've gone yes. astray in that consideration. The tenure box was requested in discovery. It was also requested by, in litigation. By specific name or by, uh, you, it was labeled that way and it was requested. It may have been labeled tenure dossier, but tenure dossier in boxes. Okay. And, and the appellees responded to that. Uh, with what, as far as we could say, would be in compliance with the request. When was it pointed out to them that the argument that perhaps that part of the request had not been complied with? Well, the way it came up, Your Honor, and this is at the record 2993, um, at a hearing to sanction my client for not supposedly giving discovery that was due, one of the uh, points from which a sanction was sought was that my client produced the tenure box. My client said during the hearing, I don't have the tenure box. I last gave it to SMU. I don't have it, at which point opposing counsel said on the record, we do not have the tenure box either. After that point, this came up again as we were ready. Uh, there was a change of Appley's counsel. Kim Askew, lead counsel, then shifts perhaps uh, to Ms. Castaneda as lead counsel, I'm not, I don't need an answer to all of that. It isn't part of it that some of what might be called the tenure box uh, response uh, uh, may not have been fully understood by the, by, the, by the change of defense counsel. I mean, Judge Brown had to deal with all these sorts of variables. So tell me why, I mean, ultimately what we're looking at, was there a failure to disclose or later to respond to a discovery of the materials that you wanted and how did and how I mean Judge Brown uh, first did she say all that material was ultimately provided or this you were too late to complain about it Judge Brown denied the 56d motion partly on the premise that the tenure box was produced and she went on to say it was produced I read it it was attached to the summary judgment filings well certainly there was a lot of material there that would be in the tenure box are you denying that I mean I that's my understanding of it. I haven't explored the record in depth before oral argument. It, it, so what was produced um, that you can see on the record in the summary ju uh, judgment appendix, which starts at record 1937 and runs to 2172, are mostly their long declarations for witnesses. It's a couple of, sorry, a handful of decision maker letters supposedly interpreting the contents of the tenure box, but the tenure box itself was not produced. When I mean box, I don't mean, we weren't asking for the physical box. SMU calls the total tenure application there is the box. A box. There, there was a physical box. From a bar that doesn't apply anymore. 2015, there was a physical box, Your Honor. But I mean, this, for instance, to, to make an analogy here, 
when your honors were nominated for judgeships, there's a long application. You have to provide records of all of these things to be evaluated by the Senate for confirmation. And then senators can ask you questions about what's in your record, what's not in your record. The equivalent of what we were given and what the court was given at summary judgment was a handful of papers from the tenure box purporting to, among other things, interpret student evaluations, interpret teaching evaluations from other peers, but we were not given all of the copies of the evidence of my client's uh, qualifications for tenure. Because it was a physical box, it's not, they're scanned now. Are you looking for the underlying documents, or are you saying there are other documents in addition to the, what you just characterized. There are other documents in addition to those, but the most important ones for this case, because she was denied tenure on the premise of her teaching, are the student evaluations, the class evaluations. If you would go to, for example, uh, Dean Collins' uh, letter where she explains her reasons for voting against tenure as the dean, that starts at record 2097. She references reading all of these evaluations. She purports to quote from evaluations. None of those evaluations, or the vast majority of them, are not in their appendix. We don't know where they come from. So you said Judge Brown quoted from something. So she had them? No, Judge, sorry. Uh, dean Collins, one of the tenure decision makers, quotes. I'm not keeping up. Yeah, and the, the issue with the district court was this. Um, we moved under Rule 56. There was no tenure box. I attached exhibits. There were 14 exhibits attesting to the importance of the tenure box, the required declaration, pointing out in the record where defendants said that they didn't have the tenure box. Eleven months later, after this was summarily denied, Judge Brown came back with a written decision in which she says, I believe the tenure box was produced because I read it. It was attached at summary judgment. Well, I, I certainly appreciate your position in meaning to make the best argument available to you. Let me make sure when this first came up, there is at least some point in either what Judge Brown said or maybe it's just the other side, that the only identified missing items was the table of contents and the kind of tabs that would have been in the box separating material. That's not was the argument that you're making now, here are the kinds of things, student evaluations, whatever else you said, was that presented to Judge Brown, and if so, when? It was. So it was presented to Judge Brown at the March 8th hearing that turned into an oral argument. It was presented again in the 56D motion, supported by two different declarations. It was also pointed out in our pretrial uh, re joint report, as well as in Professor Butler's proposed findings of fact and law. It was repeatedly elevated to the court. Counsel, let me ask you, I guess I'm shifting gears on you here. Yes. If we were to agree with you on the uh, preemption issue, the TCHRA issue, um, how, what, what kind of relief would you expect from that? Would that change everything with regard to your other issues, or does that only get you part of the way, or is that only a component part of a first element of relief that you're asking us for? It depends how the court resolves the other issues at minimum if that if the the Texas preemption issue is corrected, the case would need to be remanded because no discovery was conducted on the defamation claims themselves. To the extent the defamation claims are premised on the notion that the tenure reviewers said that they were denying tenure on the premise of what appears from the discovery we were provided, evaluations that never existed that seemingly could play to the tenure denial claims too. Do all these claims against the, the co-workers really arise from the same locus of facts as against the employer, the, co the um, law school? In other words, aren't these claims preempted because they're just artfully pled against co-workers who were all involved in the tenure process? As a matter of Texas law, no, Your Honor. Um, Where's the distinguishing line? The distinguishing line would be in the defamation claims themselves, uh, Professor Butler complains about uh, defamatory statements some of those coworkers made outside of the tenure process. Which ones were those? I'm sorry, what? Which ones were those that were outside the tenure process? Um, I, if I recall right, and I believe they're labeled in the complaint, um, statements about what I would characterize maybe as post-termination retaliation, statements that were made after Professor Butler left SMU, as well as statements that were made against her totally outside of the tenure process. Okay. <clears throat> All right, okay. Just a call. Okay. Um, if I could just draw attention to uh, the second point I wanted to make. Um, 
So this court has been presented, and there's decent case law in this circuit, on the notion that just because summary judgment is unopposed does not mean that there's a default move for the movement. Respectfully, and if this court reviews the summary judgment decision itself, and I've identified points in the brief that were a sampling of what looks like erroneous analysis, Judge Brown took the notion that summary judgment was unopposed as allowing for a finding that all of the stated issues of material fact were undisputed. What she did not do is she did not, do is she did not evaluate even the evidence that uh, SMU presented at that stage. She just full stop agreed this is what their own evidence says. Part of the problem with this, and I can draw attention to one of the particular points on this, is uh, Judge Brown said that SMU complied by all of the rules, uh, the, the bylines and the guide laws. The bylines are the rules for the law school, the guidelines are the rules for the university as a whole, um, and one of the key figures that stands out is Dean Collins did not abide by the guidelines deadline for her timing to give a decision on Professor Butler's uh, tenure. She was supposed to do give a written decision as of February 1st. She did not give a written decision until 93 days later. That's contrary to SMU's own university rules. That is plainly just she was not following the rules. In an employment discrimination case where there are procedural irregularities, that itself is evidence of bias or can be taken as such. That delay, uh, why would you be entitled to that deadline, your client? I'm sorry, can you? What harm comes from that delay? The harm that comes with the delay is Professor, or sorry, the dean held back the tenure box from the next decision makers in the sequencing. And it leads to a problem where the provost, who's the next decision maker after the dean, issued his decision on Butler's tenure one day after he got Dean Collins' uh, report, which is dated the day before. He supposedly says, and this is in the summary judgment appendix itself provided by defendants, that he spent days, he spent a long time reviewing all of the papers in the tenure box, carefully scrutinizing things, and yet Dean Collins' letter itself reflects that she held on to the box the whole time. It seems impossible under those facts that he actually reviewed it. Counsel, I I haven't seen it done this successfully before, but your uh, laptop is hiding the lights and... Yes. Thank you, Your Honor. I appreciate it. It's a pretty good argument that you didn't know your red light was on. Yes. Thank you, Your Honor. May it please the court. Um, it, my trial counsel in my ongoing trial were very understanding about this argument, so there is no trouble for me to get here, and I, I really appreciate the fact that um, y'all are hearing from us. By the time we were making the decision, I had forgotten about your notice. That's totally fine. I, I don't blame you for not immediately saying something to the court. Did you overlook no. this? It's kind of hard for a lawyer to say that, isn't it? It's nice to get a break and, and come and see a parade every once in a while, so this is good. Um, I'd like to start by talking about TICRA um, because I think that the court should feel very comfortable about the f idea that Judge Lindsay made the right decision in looking at the gravamen of the complaint in ruling on the 12B6 dismissal. And I think that the court has gotten substantial direction from the Texas Supreme Court, not only in Waffle House and Steak and Shake, but also in its hefty pile of opinions that consistently rejects attempts by plaintiffs to plead, artfully plead, around statutory schemes. I can't quite recall the phrase that Judge Wilson quite properly used, but there needs to be some distinction, it seems to me, if in fact she's been defamed or in otherwise had a tort committed against her, uh, that, is, that is actionable. When does this preemption kick in? Always? I mean, if it's in the academic environment and somebody's up for tenure? I mean, just tell me why isn't these, at least some of these comments that are seemingly independent, though they become part of the tenure process, uh, surely somebody can, if a tort is being committed in her, not in her presence, being committed against her. Well, first, if you look, over it. 
I'm sorry, Your Honor. First, if you look at the pleading, I think when a plaintiff chooses to plead her defamation claim and link all of it to the employer and to acts that the employer took through its employees, then I think you can safely say that the gravamen of the complaint is that the employer was defaming the plaintiff in terms of allegations. And it's not, it's an attempt to artfully plead around these employer versus individual requirements. And I would cite the court to pages 669 through 682 and 687 through 688 of the record where Ms. Butler lays out her defamation, the first part of her defamation claims, and all of them have to do with the tenure process. And then you look at the remainder. If in the tenure process another professor writes something derogatory about the person up for tenure and it becomes, it gets in the box, that's enough? That makes it preempted? It is enough because Ms. Butler is complaining that she was, the defamation that occurred in the tenure process created a hostile work environment and a discriminatory and unfair tenure process from evaluation to recommended denial to vote to appeal. This is- What about comments? I mean, you heard me ask counsel opposite and he said some of this came after she left SMU and it was sort of retaliatory after the fact. How could that be preempted by TECRA? That's in the rest of the allegations that Ms. Butler sets forth to support her defamation claim, which are found at 682 through 687 of the record. And every single one of those allegedly defamatory statements was made in the EEOC position paper that SMU submitted in response to her claims of defamation, of harassment, discrimination, and retaliation. And so, yes, those statements were made after the fact, but they were made in an EEOC position paper submitted by SMU, not by the individual defendants. In fact, she says at the beginning of every one of those allegations, quote, in its EEOC position paper, defendants did this or that. Defendants didn't do anything in SMU's EEOC position paper. It's SMU's. This is just another attempt to saddle the individuals with something that really is a complaint against SMU. What's the best case you've got to support, I think I called it the dividing line between preempted and not preempted? I think both Waffle House and Steak and Shake are my best cases. And I realize that neither one of them directly addresses this issue, but I think if you look at what those cases say, and then you look at the body of law in which the Texas Supreme Court rejects attempts to artfully plead around a statutory scheme and statutory restrictions, and you read Waffle House and Steak and Shake in light of those cases, I think those two cases do compel the result that I'm asking the court to reach. I mean, Steak- Do you think that this might be a circumstance where certification of the question might be appropriate? I don't think so, because I do think that the body of law should give the court confidence that this is the way the Texas Supreme Court would go. And- Are the body of law really two cases? Well, the body of law are those two cases read in the context of the other cases that reject artful pleading. And if I might just give the court a few examples of that, I think that when you look at that, you cannot, there is no reason to support thinking that the Texas Supreme Court would adopt an opinion where a plaintiff can artfully plead around TICRA's restriction, TICRA's attempt to universally address workplace discrimination, harassment, and retaliation by artfully pleading that the employer that was a corporation or a university and could only act through its employees is not the real target of the claim. If you look at, for example, Diversicare versus Rubio, that's a 2005 Texas Supreme Court opinion at 185 Southwest 3rd, 842. The court rejected the idea that a plaintiff could plead a healthcare liability claim as a negligence claim or a premises liability claim in that case. 
And the court said, we are not bound by the niceties of pleadings and a mere recasting of a health care liability claim uh, in the garb of some other cause of action is not sufficient to preclude the application of the statute. The court has done the same with the arbitration statute. Um, in Merrill Lynch, um, 235 Southwest 3rd, 185, the court said that parties to an arbitration agreement may not evade the arbitration statute through artful pleading, such as by naming individual agents of the party to the arbitration clause and suing them in their individual capacity. And in evaluating that issue, the court specifically said corporations can only act through human agents and we're not going to allow someone to evade the statutes that compel arbitration and uphold an important public policy simply by alleging a claim against a corporation's employees as opposed to the corporation itself. It's done the same thing with the Federal Communications Decency Act in the Facebook case that came out in 2021, saying that um, if the allegations made by a plaintiff are simply another way of claiming that a defendant was liable for conduct made illegal by the statute, they can't evade the statute by pleading a state law tort claim. They've done it with the Texas Education Code in Clint ISD versus Marquez, 487 Southwest 3rd, 538. The court agreed with the plaintiffs that the constitutional provisions that they had invoked were not school laws that would require a certain procedure to be followed under the Texas Education Code. But the court said, we do not agree, however, that the way the parents pleaded their causes of action controls the outcome of this case. The nature of the claims, rather than the nomenclature, controls the outcome, uh, controls, and artful pleadings cannot circumvent statutory jurisdictional requirements. And they made clear that the petition as a whole reflected the true nature of the parent's complaint, and that was what was going to govern whether the statute applied. Finally, a uh, final example anyway, uh, the Texas Tort Claims Act. Um, the court in Sampson versus University of Texas, 500 Southwest 3rd, 380, stated that the Tort Claims Act scheme of a limited waiver of immunity from suit does not allow plaintiffs to circumvent the heightened standards of a premises defect claim contained in the statute by recasting the same acts as a claim relating to the negligent condition or use of tangible property. And they went and considered the nature of the claim and looked at that um, to decide how to, how, whether it was subject to the statutory requirements. The court's done that as well with common law situations, um, rejecting attempts to circumvent uh, common law requirements for one sort of claim or another premises liability versus negligence, contract versus tort, that kind of thing, um, throughout the years. And so where I'm going with these cases is that when you look at the hostility and consistent hostility and consistent rejection that the Texas Supreme Court has met attempts to artfully plead around statutes that were meant to govern a certain type of claim or a certain area of the law, um, and you read Steak and Shake and Waffle House in that context, I think you can be confident that there is not a strong reason to believe that if given the opportunity, the Texas Supreme Court would adopt the position that Judge Lindsay got it wrong. And I think, oh, go ahead. Return to that if you have Certainly. time later. Let me ask you about discovery in this case, uh, it seems to me this case is maybe premised on, on the concept that there are these statements that, that were made that were unfair, discriminatory, whatever else, but there's not yet been full disclosure of what was in the tenure box where that sort of material would have appeared. So why don't you respond to that possibility? Well. The possibility, that's too general. Just how was this, why should we be satisfied that discovery was properly handled? Uh, there does seem to be misunderstandings at times by various counsel, whether that material was provided uh, or not. How do we know if it was, and do we need to know if it was, which is a procedural question, I suppose. Well, I think that the way the court would know 
um, if anything was missing from what SMU produced, um, and also how the court would know whether if there was anything missing, it was material, would be for Ms. Butler and Mr. Young to identify that to the court, and so far they have not been able to do so. In a way, you may just be saying it's speculative. Uh, she has argued in her case, and her case is based on, it seems to me, these, the potential for unfair discriminatory statements. And so she wanted where those state, the complete collection of those statements made regarding her tenure. And there's at least an argument being made in the briefing and again this morning that all that wasn't turned over, so the particularly smoking gun statements were never provided. I don't see a place in the record where there was any mention made that anything that was added to the box um, by SMU was not produced. What is allegedly not in there are materials that Ms. Was the tenure box as a two-word phrase right. requested in discovery and did SMU provide it? Is that your position? The Either tenure, one of those wrong? The tenure box was not requested. Dossier? The tenure dossier or the materials that were submitted for tenure, I believe, were requested. I mean, the concept I'm looking for, it seems to me there was this collection. Now, yep. Whatever is labeled was the collection requested in discovery, and how do we know if it was provided? And we've represented on the record to the court under our duties of candor to the court and honesty to the court that those materials were provided. But you don't have to just take my word for it. Uh, Mr. Butler himself at the January 2023 hearing um, on page 3571 of the record um, confirmed that they received everything that decision makers inserted into the box which I believe would cover, that would be the SMU side. So everything that decision makers wrote and put in the box for others to consider, student evaluations, everything that SMU added, they got, and Mr. Young conceded that. What it looks like they're saying they didn't get is that they didn't get what Ms. Butler submitted for inclusion. I don't think that's accurate. If you look at what we produced, there are materials that I would submit she submitted. Um, and I believe that's what Judge Brown was referring to um, in her uh, stated reasons. Um, and if you look at page 56 of our brief, we talk a little bit about that aspect of what Ms. Young or what Ms. Butler submitted and how she cannot recall what she submitted and she cannot recall if the, what we produced lacked anything that she submitted. So I don't, I'm a little perplexed at how SMU is supposed to produce more documentation when nothing has been identified that we didn't produce. And we attempted to produce everything that we had that was materials that were considered in the tenure Let me ask, process. Should the tenure box have had comments, emails, letters, whatever? from uh, colleagues about her abilities at whatever level, and were those, were such things in discovery, provided in discovery? Um, I believe emails were provided, and again, at the same page, 3571, I believe that the concession was that emails were provided and that the other side could not identify any emails that weren't provided, and so, I've been through many discovery disputes. I know that your honors have as well. Um, it's just, it, usually in a discovery dispute, someone is at least saying, there's this category of documents that we know we did not get. We know it was in there, and we know we didn't get it, and they can't even do that. And Aren't so I don't know what to do. the context of a Rule 56D motion to reopen discovery? Yes. And, and, and so aren't we also talking about, I mean, I don't know that that motion was necessarily timely filed. Correct. Correct. So we're talking about a request to reopen something after discovery had otherwise closed? Yes. That was committed to the trial court's discretion and that was considered in the context of not only its untimeliness and not, and not only the upcoming trial and summary judgment issues, but also um, 
considered in the context of the moving party cannot identify anything they didn't get. Well, you mentioned summary judgment. Let's talk about that. You heard counsel opposite say that the district court basically treated it as a default summary judgment motion and then granted it. So you, I suspect you might have an issue with that. You could explain your side. I do disagree. Um, I don't believe that the court treated it as a default summary judgment. Um, there are two pieces to this. First of all, to the extent that um, Ms. Butler had uh, an initial burden to bring forward a prima facie case um, for discrimination or such claims, um, and she did not um, timely present evidence to meet that burden, then it is entirely appropriate for Judge Brown to um, hold that um, there is no evidence that would meet that burden, and therefore we don't go any further and that claim is, is gone. Um, and I don't think that, that the fact that a plaintiff has a prima facie, has a burden to make a prima facie case and fails to even uh, create a genuine issue of material fact on that, I don't think that that transforms a summary judgment into a no evidence summary judgment. That's a traditional summary judgment on a claim that places the initial burden on the plaintiff to even raise the prima facie case. Having said that, on all of the claims, the claims for discrimination and harassment and retaliation, SMU provided ample summary judgment evidence to show that it did not act in a discriminatory fashion or retaliatory fashion or harassing fashion. Um, on all of the claims, um, SMU provided summary judgment evidence in support of its motion and to the extent that Ms. Butler disputed the concept that SMU followed its policies and procedures, denied tenure because she did not meet the tenure uh, requirements um, or any other basis for her claims, she was required to come forth and put forth controverting evidence. And in Judge Brown's opinion, I don't think that statements that there is no evidence of something means that she's putting, she's transferring the burden to the non-movement. I think what she's saying is, in light of SMU's evidence, which she discusses earlier in the opinion, there's no controverting evidence of these things. So the summary, I'm very confident that the summary judgment record um, that SMU built and that Judge Brown made her decision upon uh, supports that summary judgment. All right, counsel. Thank you very much, Your Honor. Thank you, Your Honors, and I'll put my laptop over here so that there's no mistake. <sighs> Every courtroom's a little bit different. Um, a few quick points. Uh, Judge Englehart, you raised the possibility of certifying a question to the Texas Supreme Court. I think that might be appropriate. I believe Judge Southwick recently set on a case involving SMU and COVID and a question was certified to the Texas court to get clarification. The clarification might be necessary here. I believe that Waffle House and Steak and Shake support our position. Both cases recognize that um, there is not total preemption against coworkers for certain torts. The other cases that my friend on the other side references, they're mostly Northern District of Texas cases interpreting Texas law and a few intermediate appellate courts in Texas not the Texas Supreme Court. On an eerie posture, it's proper to defer to Texas's own interpretation of Is it true law. that all the statements that are post are in the EEOC statement that SMU filed? No, Your Honor. I believe my friend mischaracterized the complaint. Like most federal complaints, each count incorporates and restates everything above it. There are statements that are made during B Professor Butler's employ, during the tenure process, after the tenure process, and then after she left SMU. Um, did, did that answer your question, Your Honor? Okay, as to the missing discovery, there's no evidence on the record that this box was produced. Uh, below, defendants argued that they, they were not required to identify the tenure materials by Bates number. That's sort of a customary way in which you say, 
we served you with what we served you with, it's very odd that even on appeal they maintain that position. We don't even have to identify these records. And again, the motion, uh, uh, separate point, the 56D motion was timely filed. Under the rules, that motion can only be filed after discovery is closed and before a summary judgment decision has been made. That is the window in which we filed the motion. So it was uh, timely, at least under the rules. Well, maybe timely, but you're still asking to reopen discovery that's otherwise passed which is the premise of the 56D motion. That is the only purpose of a 56D motion. Well, that you don't have enough to respond to summary judgment, and so you need to go find. But, but that, that motion could either be raised during discovery, I mean, if the motion is filed at that time, or you could have sought this stuff during the discovery period. Yes. This isn't a surprise piece of evidence. We're talking about the tenure box, right? It's not a surprise piece of evidence. It was a surprise that defendants couldn't identify it and they had ever-changing definitions of what they wanted to call the tenure box, the tenure dossier. What we do have below is a statement in November 2019 by Ms. Askew representing to the court, they do not have, SMU does not have the tenure box. Fast forward to 2023, Ms. Askew tells the same court, we provided it before that November hearing. Those two statements cannot both be true. All right, counsel. Thank you, Your Honors. Both of you. Uh, and appreciate you working with us on setting up this time for argument. And thank you, Your Honors, for allowing.